This is Public Resource. That's right. Get a shot and have a beer. Hey, Greg, I am drinking Open Access Ninja. It's the brew of law. Oh, I'm one of those. Cheers. Thank you. Salute. Come by. Open Access Ninja. It's the brew of law. I'm Thomas Gideon, the brewer behind Open Access Ninja. It's the brew of law. Making beer is a series of choices starting with the ingredients. Water, malted grains, hops, and yeast. Malting is a process where barley is sprouted and then stopped. Brewers restart this process by adding heat and water to malted barley. The result is conversion of starch in the grain kernel into sugar that yeast can consume. This is the same process that the plant uses to fuel its own growth. Brewers select malt for the flavors and color they impart. I selected Pelton, a pale, delicious craft malt from Oregon, similar to those produced in Europe. The next choice is water, which makes up more than 90% of most beer. Open Access Ninja is modeled after a Pilsner, named for the city Pilsen, where that style was originally brewed. The source water there has a distinctive flavor and makeup. Some brewers add minerals to their water in order to emulate different profiles like that from Pilsen. My approach is to embrace the character of any and all local ingredients that I use. I use my local municipal water passed through a three-stage filter. I make minimal adjustments for functional reasons such as yeast health. The final ingredient are the hops. Hops give beer its characteristic bitterness, offsetting the sweetness from the malt and the alcohol. Hops also help preserve the beer. They have natural antimicrobial properties. From these basic ingredients and choices come many styles of beer. In my opinion, knowledge is the best brewing tool. Understanding the application of engineering and science, chemistry and biology helps me achieve exactly the beer I have in mind and to do so over and over again. I like to think open access to knowledge 
is a fifth ingredient to great beer. I've spent most of my career focused on technology. You might recognize my online handle command line for my software and podcasts. I first grappled with the challenges around open access to knowledge when I originally was learning about open source and free software. In brewing, open access is actually pretty common. Most brewers share what they know freely. Same ethos, we don't call it that. I brewed a beer in recognition of Carl's work years ago, simply out of profound appreciation. Soon after, I became involved with his project FedFlix as a volunteer. Both of those led to us collaborating on Our Nation's Attic, in many ways, a project very similar to this one. I believe it's important to do more than make. We must stand up for what's right. When Carl and I started talking about what would become Open Access Ninja, it lit up the same amazing intersection of interests. I try to live my life making the world better. What more fun way to catalyze that than through beer? I've been rethinking my career to focus more on beer and brewing. Andrea, my partner and I, are working on a venture, Quiet Skiing, that will allow us to share more of the beer that I make. We're still figuring out what form this is gonna take. We are definitely committed to building it on values of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We want our business to be part of a community where everyone is welcome, where everybody helps each other, and where we work together for the common good. and I'm a law professor at the University of Washington School of Law in Seattle. Also, I love beer. A few years ago, I got curious about whether IP laws aligned or misaligned with the creative, scientific, and business practices on the ground in one of my favorite industries, the craft brewing industry. I conducted 22 semi-structured interviews with key figures in Seattle's local craft brewing scene. What I found was that brewers, by and large, didn't think very much about intellectual property laws, and their practices reflected a commitment in the opposite direction of exclusive rights. So instead, what I saw were practices and values committed to sharing information, sharing resources, sharing recipes even in some cases, uh, and collaborating, whether on uh, beers or on various kinds of projects. It reminded me, in fact, of the open source software uh, community, which I was familiar with as a copyright scholar, uh, where the idea of a collectivist ethos drives uh, a great amount of productivity and, and creativity in the field. Um, I kept hearing in my interviews this mantra, a rising tide lifts all boats. And the idea is similar in software and in beer, uh, right? Everybody working together or sharing a, what they know and what they have uh, makes for better software and better beer. Free as in freedom. Free as in beer. Now you can have it all. When I started Public Resource in 2007, I started by posting video from congressional hearings, which resulted in a bit of a set to with C-SPAN. After they sent a takedown to Speaker Pelosi for posting video of herself testifying before Congress, I started buying all their hearings and posting them without permission. Now, to their credit, they changed their policies to disclaim copyright over government works. Since I was doing video, I started looking around the .gov world and found that the executive branch had a long and distinguished record of making great video. I convinced the National Technical Information Service to start shipping me their old tapes. I digitized them, posted the videos on YouTube and the Internet Archive, then sent NTIS back a disk drive. This was the birth of FedFlix. When Barack Obama took office, I got to know David Ferriero, the newly appointed archivist of the United States. He had great plans to put the archives online, but things go slow in government, and I offered to help. And that's when I started working with Thomas Gideon. In the middle of a blizzard, David Ferriero, Thomas Gideon, and a bunch of volunteers joined me at the offices of the Sunlight Foundation and kicked off our International Amateur Scanning League, even made the New York Times. 
Thomas led a group of volunteers who showed up at the National Archives with DVD duplicators and stacks of blank DVDs. They systematically started copying government films and sent them back to me in California. I bought a half a dozen DVD drives and ripped them all to disk and uploaded them. Fedflix now has over 6,000 videos and the channel has had over 87 million views on YouTube. A bit later, the Smithsonian started sending takedowns to an artist on Etsy that was using 19th century seed catalogs to make cute arts and crafts. This stuff was all public domain, and the Smithsonian is certainly an instrumentality of the United States government, one whose chartered purpose is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. I created a site called What Would Luther Burbank Do? that stated our position that our nation's addicts shouldn't be locked up behind a cash register. As a form of protest, we started using those seed catalogs on coffee cups, which we called increase and in diffusion of mocha mugs, and beer glasses, which we called Smithsonsteins. All these items had the phrase used without permission on them. Thomas made us a killer beer, our nation's addict, an American pale ale made with victory hops. The labels all featured seed catalogs and used without permission. We also made postcards. We, we went to town. We sent all that stuff over to the Smithsonian Castle just to make sure they knew what we were doing. And we hosted a great reception over at the New America Foundation. Hundreds of people sent in postcards to the Smithsonian asking them to change their policies. Did they? Well, it took a decade for them to change their policies, but a senior Smithsonian official told me that it would have taken way longer if we hadn't tabled the issue so definitively. They didn't talk to us, but they noticed. We made our point. My goal at Public Resource is always to get the government to do the right thing, to post materials on their own volition. If they won't do that, then we do it for them, but that's a temporary thing, a means to an end. You've got to make sure the authorities know you've got an issue with the status quo. You can't question authority if authority has no idea you're there. When I posted the official code of Georgia annotated, I sent a copy of that code to the Speaker of the Georgia House on a George Washington thumb drive. They apparently noticed since they sued me, and they called me a terrorist in their complaint to boot. In my years of agitating to free the PACER database, I've encouraged people to send in postcards of protest. We even created a PACER polling place at the Internet Archive to get people to come in and write their messages. I sent those postcards to members of Congress and judges. Did it do any good? Nah. <laughs> Not yet, at least. But if you're going to tilt at windmill, sometimes the windmill will be oblivious. It took me 10 years to help get the U.S. patent database properly online. It will likely have taken 20 years before PACER will have changed. The reason I print and make and create this kind of stuff is partly because I love to print. My grandfather was a working printer, and I used to go to his shop and typeset. The stuff we print is a great way to say thank you to our volunteers and donors. Nothing like swag to keep people involved. But printing is more than that. You have to present your case if you're going to change the way things work. Perhaps that means walking to the sea to make salt or sitting down at a lunch counter in defiance of the law. Perhaps that means putting a code on a thumb drive. The stakes can be as high as justice and civil rights, or the stakes can be as mundane as changing your local school board policies or something in between. You can't do activism unless you're active. You've got to tell people why you're there, why they should listen. This is the ancient art of petitioning authorities to affect change. In Hinswad Raj, Gandhi was quoting Justice Ranade when he said, petitions serve a useful purpose because they are a means of educating people. They give the latter an idea of their condition and warn the rulers. For me, this is all about printing. For Thomas, he makes beer and open source software. We all do what we can do. What's important is that you do it with purpose. Open Access Ninja. It's the brew of law. I've been 
fighting for the public domain uh, my whole career. I've written probably uh, six articles about the, the public domain. And the public domain has many, many, many elements to it. Um, and lots of it is the stuff that copyright expired. Lots of it is stuff that people didn't actually used to claim copyright in. Uh, and if you didn't claim it, it was in the public domain. And I wish we had that rule again, but we don't. Uh, the latest fights uh, about the public domain uh, that I've been involved in uh, have been uh, about the, the reasons why the interfaces of computer programs that are necessary to achieve compatibility should be in the public domain. And uh, this issue has been fought about since 1985. Uh, and uh, finally, the Supreme Court, uh, in a decision between Google and Oracle, um, uh, just in April, decided that actually re-implementing interfaces of computer programs uh, was not copyright infringement. I had wanted them to decide that it was uh, in the public domain, um, uh, but the court just decided that it was fair use. Um, and fair use can sometimes be a way to protect the public domain, or at least the right of the public to be able to reuse certain kinds of things for, uh, for beneficial purposes. And I really like that the Supreme Court said, look, part of the reason why we want copyright to be limited is so that other people can be creative, so they can build on the, uh, on the, the uh, creativity uh, of previous people. Um, and fair use can do that. Um, sort of the scope of copyright can be narrowed, as I think it should be. Uh, and so there's many, many elements of this. I think Carl Malamud's victory in the Georgia case uh, to persuade the Supreme Court that actually the, the, the law um, and things that are, um, uh, are government edicts uh, are unprotected by copyright law was a big victory for the public domain. I think the biggest one that we've had, um, except maybe the Google case, uh, but um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm focused a lot on the computer program stuff because um, Boy, people, c companies like Oracle have been trying to expand copyright, expand copyright, um, and it would really hurt not just Google, but all the sort of startups that want to be able to emulate the, the other programs, that want to be able to make things that work together with other programs. That's, a, that's something where the, the public doesn't realize how important the public domain is. Part of what we're trying to achieve in making these cases um, uh, before the courts is to persuade uh, the public that they've got a stake in this too. Open Access Ninja, an open source Pilsner style logger. We often hear the idea that information wants to be free, but I had a long talk with information we went away for a weekend, we had a sweat lodge, uh, we cried about our fathers. And when it was over, information took me a long kind of soulful hug and whispered its deepest secret in my ear, which is that the only thing information wants from us is for us to stop anthropomorphizing it. Because information doesn't want a damn thing, but people want to be free. And in an information society, the way you make people free is by giving them technological self-determination. The, the right to decide which of their data is collected and how it's used, the right to decide how the digital networks that make up their world are regulated, the right to decide whether or not it's time to throw away a device that they rely on for education and uh, access to employment and family and healthcare and romance and so on, or whether they can get it repaired. And, and if they can get it repaired, by whom, by which independent repair shop, which software they can run on those devices. All of those things, those are, are critical to living in a free society, not a free society that's some kind of like Mad Max vision where we all you know, sort of run around competing to see who's free to eat the other one, but a free society where we can make common cause to hold our democratically elected politicians to account and get them to enact policies that reflect our common needs and not the needs of a, a few powerful people and also a society where we're free to get together and live our own lives in ways that benefit us, that, that we can choose the entertainment and the discourse and the um, products and the services and the communities that make the most sense to us 
and that serve our needs rather than the needs of a large company, whether it's funded by advertising or by building a walled garden and selling you stuff in it. Open Access Ninja. Here, hold my beer. So everyone's heard of big tech, but have you heard about the data cartels? Just a few companies are stockpiling all of our data and they've taken over a bunch of information markets. Companies like Thomson Reuters and RELX or RELX, which is the corporate mashup of publishing and data giants Reed Elsevier and LexisNexis, monopolize our laws and our legal information. They monopolize our scientific and scholarly research. Uh, they, they monopolize a lot of our up-to-date financial data some types of news sources, and even the most creepy type of information, our personal data. These companies block us from seeing the most important public information while simultaneously selling off our most private personal information to people like our bosses, our banks, our landlords, and even the police. They use anti-competitive tricks and tools to squash competition, and they derive up prices by forcing consumers to sign non-disclosure agreements and pay exorbitant fees to see information. The data cartels mess with our ability to seek and receive information, or as librarians like to call it, our intellectual freedom, in two ways. First, the companies put up paywalls around their information, um, and the, it's the kind of information that we need in order to make responsible legal, health, and financial decisions. Their paywalls are a kind of financial censorship. The companies don't let people see information until they pay the right price. And they make billions of dollars selling laws and research that were funded by our tax sellers, charging us for information that we already paid for, right? They also sell our digital exhaust, the data we leave behind when we participate in the digital world. Selling that kind of data deters us from doing things like poking around online, using information platforms, and doing other digital activities that we might need to do for our jobs, our social lives, or, or you know, any other part of our, our digital world. So RELX and Thomson Reuters zealously protect their private information libraries and charge us a premium to see them, but they don't protect our privacy. And in fact, they expose us to surveillance. So I know that we've all heard of companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook and those other big tech giants. But if you ask me, it's time we hear more about big data and learn more about these data cartels and their anti-competitive activities. We are the Data Liberation Front. The big data cartels have hidden your data behind paywalls and made knowledge into their property. Unfortunately, up until now, it's required that you buy your knowledge one product at a time. Data. 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 For the past year, we've been working from a data center in an undisclosed location. Knowledge belongs to all the people. We must reclaim the public domain and make access to knowledge a basic human right. Data. 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 We must all be patriots. We must all join the revolution. We must fight big data. We must reclaim the end-to-end -end principle and the free internet. We are the Data Liberation Front, and we drink Open Access Ninja. It's the brew of law. Knowledge remains behind paywalls. Science is behind paywalls, too. Just last week, me and my colleagues, we were informed that yet another journal subscription is being dropped from the library. Because, of course, of a financial crunch. So the publisher approached us with a raised subscription fee and the institution could, could, could no longer afford it. And so it was dropped. This is not the first time that a journal has been uh, dropped from our subscription, but I'm one of the lucky people because I work for one of the, uh, one of the, one of the leading research organizations in India. God forbid, if you were not formally associated with the university, you know, or a, or, a, or a research organization or a repository, or if you were like one of my students who are still working at from home because of the pandemic, then it would have been completely inaccessible. You would have had zero access. 
2020 was the year of science, right? But most of it still remains locked behind these expensive publisher paywalls and therefore inaccessible to the people who need it. Publishers don't want readers. They want one, authors like me who are willing to, to give their work for free. Two, universities who have to buy paywalled content. And three, false metrics like citations. Citizens don't want these citations, they want science. So the core point is that access to scientific knowledge remains, in access, remains, remains unavailable to me. Access to, access to scientific knowledge remains unavailable to my students and my colleagues. And that is a huge impediment for research, for, for education, and for text and data mining. That's my issue. Knowledge has been colonized. Publishers are trading it for profit. And these faceless, nameless organizations, they are the new Maxwells. So where does that leave us, the scholars? We are the new indigo farmers. Unless we fight, we will perish. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tanisha Jackland, the Lady of Fire. Where the mind is without fear, the head held high. Where knowledge is unfettered, where stone walls lie. In their confined courtyards bound night and day, have kept not this world in broken bits of disarray. Where welling from founts of hearts unconstrained, gush forth words, endeavors flow unrestrained. Across many a land and in manifold paths to race, a myriad thousand different aspirations to grace. Where smothering sands of trifle worthless custom have not engulfed the path of the stream of reason. Smash not manhood into a hundred pieces lead Where you each day every joy thought indeed With pitiless blow of thine own hand consummate Into that heaven, my father, let my country awake Talking about things that are internet things, tech things, things like the right to fix, the right to make, the right to make APIs, the right to encrypt, the right to reverse engineer the public domain, universal access to an open and decentralized internet, universal access to human knowledge. But you might rightly ask, are there not more serious problems facing us today? I mean, really? A global climate crisis that we ignore while we blithely continue to destroy our planet. A raging pandemic and unequal distribution of patented vaccines developed with public funds on top of what was already an existing epidemic of famine and disease. The poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting obscenely richer. It isn't a gap anymore. It's a canyon, an uncrossable chasm. Our economy is structurally unfair. Our systems of justice all over the world have become ever more unjust. We sell, we deny, we delay access to right and justice. Housing is inaccessible and inadequate, and public transit is crumbling, but private equity is getting fat on buying up and milking mobile home parks and private prisons and usurious loan brokers. Fascism and delusional misinformation spread like wildfires. Our electoral processes are commandeered by the rich and the crazy and by autocrats and fascists. Who cares about access to knowledge in this world, in this litany of horrors and calamities that demand our attention? Should we not work instead on stuff that matters? I put it to you that access to knowledge is absolutely necessary. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient but it is something we must do. Democracy depends on an informed citizenry. 
John Adams insisted we must let every sluice of knowledge be set aflowing, for only then will our rulers become our public servants. Economic opportunity, access to the essential human utilities of water and gas, and electricity and internet, housing for all, these are things that can only happen when we build a fair and just society. A society not built for Ayn Rand toting money-hungry speculators and seekers of arbitrage and rent. To change the world, we must know the world. We must educate ourselves and our neighbors. We must seize the reins. This is not easy. Martin Luther King taught us that justice and change don't come rolling in on the wheels of inevitability. They come only with continuous struggle. Dr. King called for us to escape the dark and desolate valley of injustice, for us to straighten that crooked path, to climb together this road to a shining city on the hill. Access to knowledge is one of those paths we can walk on. Today, Scientists are the new indigo farmers, forced to beg for financing, forced to ship their work off to foreign corporations, buying back high-priced finished goods only from the company store. Scientific knowledge has become colonized. Librarians are told they can't loan books to people. They are told that as a condition for opening the sluices of knowledge to their patrons, they must spy on them, or they will be denied licenses from private equity-funded poachers who claim they are the purported owners of our public domain. Lawyers and citizens are told that our laws are proprietary and may only be accessed under the strictest conditions and at the dearest of prices. Even the most critical public safety information, fire codes and COVID vaccines are copyrighted and patented, designed to extract rents from the well-to-do walled off from those without means, abandoning any sense of public purpose, abandoning public good for private gain. Computer users are told they can't fix their computers. Farmers are told they can't fix their tractors. The details of your life, your every move, have become products commoditized by big tech and big data. Knowledge has become commoditized. Information has become chickenized and privatized. But this world is not inevitable. Leo Tolstoy was fascinated by the Sermon on the Mount. He embraced it to become a better anarchist. When Jesus stood on the mountain of Beatitudes, he taught love and nonviolence, lessons that inspired Tolstoy and put him on a path to learn how to resist and question authority using those tools. A young lawyer in London, Mohandas K. Gandhi, was in turn inspired by Tolstoy to take that same path of nonviolent resistance, of loving thy enemy. Gandhiji became especially entranced by the idea that was presented that day in that sermon on that mountain, the idea of bread labor, that by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou earn thy bread. To Gandhi, this meant that one must do labor every day. One must do manual labor, turning grain into bread through manual labor. Or perhaps in the modern parable of Thomas the Brewer, turning grain into beer and sending it to the Smithsonian as an act of love. But it wasn't bread. <laughs> it's certainly not beer that Gandhiji made. Think of the iconic images of Gandhi at his spinning wheel, making thread, urging everybody else to make thread, to make that thread into whole cloth, into khadi, so that India could break the oppressive chain of commerce and servitude where India shipped cotton off to England and bought back high-priced finished cloth from the mills of Manchester. Bread labor, bread labor with a purpose, was to Gandhi how India could become self-sufficient, how India could become free. What you may not know was that Gandhi's first bread labor at his ashram in South Africa was not spinning thread. It was typesetting. Everybody at the Phoenix ashram had to do manual labor every day, and running the printing press was their bread labor. Gandhi wasn't very good at typesetting, but he put in the effort, and of course, he was an amazing editor and a writer for the ages. That printing press, in turn, disseminated knowledge throughout the Indian diaspora in South Africa, teaching them about self-reliance and their rights and the path they must take, nonviolently, 
to better their world, to change their world, that bread labor changed the world. It was the beginning of decolonization. In addition to bread labor, Gandhi preached the importance of public work, doing work that benefits your community. Typesetting or spinning were not just hobbies, ways to pass the time. They were a way to set that crooked path straight, to climb to that shining city on the hill. I put it to you that we must embrace bread labor. We must embrace public work. You might be a librarian teaching your patrons the arts and crafts of finding and using knowledge. You might be a coder, making open source software on which we can build a better, more open internet. You might be a scanner, transforming and preserving knowledge for all to access freely in the belief that scanning is the new spinning. But no matter what you do, you've got to serve somebody. You've got to serve the public domain. You've got to do public work. We must all be public servants. Universal access to knowledge is the great promise of our times, but we must all do our part if we are to build this public park for our global village. Who may swim in the ocean of knowledge? Who may stand on the shoulders of giants? Who will fling open the gates to the walled gardens? Who will man the ramparts and seize the means of computation? May it be all of us. Let us be the change we wish to see. What did you make today? What wheel are you spinning now? By the sweat of your brow, make your bread, make your bread. Scan if you can, so every written word may be read. And never let it be said, we don't know how. We know how, yeah, we know how to make it better. Who did you slip today? Who did you help today? Did you serve somebody? Did you help someone come with me? Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. Findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Black frog crows flocking in to volunteer. Hold my beer. Open access ninja. Tinker, improve it, hack it, or fix it. Inquire, create, unpack it, remix it. 
not just a consumer or just another user like Dale D. Start making it here. Open Access Ninja. Open Access Ninja. DRM doesn't respect me. DRM doesn't really manage rights. DRM doesn't really matter. So fill my decanter with open access ninja. Does it have to be here's too? Can it be another toast? So on five, all right. Five. To the barricades, comrades, we must seize the means of computation. <laughs> Here we go. Here's to the right to access and use all science so that we may stand on the shoulders of giants. Here's to promoting the progress of science and useful arts. Um, through the public domain. Salute. All right, let's do it again real quick. That was great. Okay. And then it's fish taco time. Okay, sounds good. To free information. <laughs> Here's to open access to knowledge. Free and freedom, free and beer. To free information. To free information. Mmm. Mm. Taste the open source. <laughs> Taste the freedom. Taste Let's the say freedom. taste the freedom. Okay. Yeah. To, to free, free information. information. <laughs> no, that was so dumb. <laughs> well, I think it's supposed to be dumb. Oh. All right. That's good. That's good. That's fine. It's good beer. It is good beer. It, it's good beer. <laughs>